Hello and welcome to the D4 Tabletop Creative Conference panel on writing the rulebook and teaching games, how to communicate gameplay clearly and concisely in written and verbal formats. That is the full title of this panel. My name is Becca Scott. I'm your moderator today. I'm also a tabletop content creator, actor, and I'm going to say professional role player. Uh, the purpose of this panel is to help you new game creators or potential game creators to make the best, most perfect rule book imaginable. And uh, we want to teach you how to write that better rule book using these wonderful panelists' expertise and talk about how and why videos have become very ubiquitous to teaching games. Um, today, I'm joined by these four fabulous panelists. Uh, and we're gonna start by going around our virtual table here. I'd like everyone to introduce themselves, their names, their pronouns if you like, and your contribution to tabletop gaming, as well as where people can find you and your work. Let's start with Jason. Okay, uh, my name is Jason Perez. I am from the Shelf Stories YouTube channel. That is my personal channel in which I engage in above the table conversations about things around the gaming industry. So culture and history and gender and the different conversations that we're having around the board gaming verse. I also am a contributor, my specific gaming content on the Dice Tower and the One Stop Co-op Shop. T? Uh, I am T Kairos, uh, they, them pronouns. Uh, I work for Hava Games. I am the Hava Games channel manager for the US division. And a big part of that job is uh, I do the English rules proofing and translations for all Hava Games worldwide. So even if it doesn't come into the US, I'm still the one doing the English proofing uh, and translations for the rule books. Uh, so yeah, and you can find me personally on Twitter at the one tar. Monique? Hi, my name is Monique, and I run a board gaming YouTube channel with my partner Naveen called Before You Play. And uh, we pretty much do full two-player playthroughs of uh, sometimes like heavier strategy games, but really all types of games with an emphasis on teaching. Uh, we also started recently producing gameplay videos on Watch It Played. And so you can find our content over on YouTube as well as on Twitter and Instagram. And last but not least, Dustin. I'm Dustin Schwartz, he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm a freelance rulebook writer and editor, um, worked on, uh, I guess I'm just south of 200 rule books so far, um, but uh, just doing it all freelance. And uh, online, I guess I'm mostly on Twitter. You can find me at Dustin B. Schwartz over there. Excellent. Obviously, these people know what they're talking about when it comes to rule books. So let's start with just sort of everyone's philosophy on teaching games, just sort of an overview. Um, how do you just, what are the like the three things people should know about how to effectively communicate the rules to a game? Whoever wants to jump in, feel free. I should probably uh, start because I forgot to mention why I'm on the panel. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I, have a, I have a psychological background and uh, and I, my interest is in, you know, so we talk a lot about the teaching of rule book, but there's also mm -hmm. like a receptor on the other side. So like I try to ma make um, contributions in terms of helping people understand how people learn mm -hmm. and learning styles. So that would be my opening thing is understanding that the different people have different learning styles. Not everybody responds to what I call the kind of like the banking education where it's like, here's your re empty receptacle. We're pouring information into the empty receptacle, which I think is the, maybe the biggest thing that rule books do and not just rule books, textbooks and different media in terms of like, how do I impart information? Well, just give it to you. And there's a whole spectrum of learning styles that I think needs, that should be encountered. Uh, and not that that's, not that there's anything bad about that, but as the only way to disseminate information, I, I want to kind of, you know, talk about uh, uh, doing it different ways. So that's kind of my opening salvo. Awesome. I want to talk more about people's different learning styles, but I also want to hear more about uh, everyone here's teaching styles and maybe throw in your learning style, if you like. What about you, T? Um, so it's, it's very interesting because my learning style is I do very well with 
what we would maybe consider more technical rule books, uh, rule books that you sit down and you read and they're basically textbooks. Um, I love those. Uh, I read a lot of Dustin's rule books actually. Um, <laughs> but um, when it comes to teaching, I actually do a great job uh, teaching to less technical, um, which is one of the things that I do a lot at Haba. A lot of our games are for kids and families. And so what we're often having to do is take this very technical rule set, which I mean, it's not super technical, but if you're talking about an audience that maybe has never really played games before, it can seem technical. And then you have to convert it into something that is a lot more simplistic, more casual, and more um, something easy that a parent can read while they're also dealing with like a three-year-old uh, that's just very excited about playing the game. So um, for me personally, like I said, love the technical, um, but also, and also I love technical rules. I cannot learn from videos. I'm so sorry, Monique. Uh, I've tried <laughs> with your videos. I'm the same way, actually. <laughs> so uh, yeah, <laughs> it's really, it's really interesting. Like I love reading rule books. I love turning them around in my head and then like processing them out a different way that's more simplistic that people can understand uh and not a technical way but I cannot consume games that way I just get frustrated <laughs> <laughs> what about you Monique I, that's so funny that you mentioned that because I'm the exact same way I cannot learn from watching videos or from like listening to anybody teach so if I show up to a game night and I know that somebody else is going to teach the game I know I'm going to lose because I'm going to miss out on like a good portion of the rules so I have to sit there and read the rule books myself um, and so going off of kind of what, what Jason was mentioning the the biggest thing for me is kind of meeting where your audience is. And so knowing your audience and knowing who you're teaching the game to is one of the most important things mm -hmm. to me. And so on our YouTube channel, we are, you know, for the most part, teaching the game to potentially anybody, right? Anybody who are not necessarily hobby gamers. And so another thing for me would be just making sure that you don't ever assume knowledge. And so when we kind of go about the teach, we always try to introduce concepts that might not be something that other people will be familiar with if they're not hobby board gamers. Um, and then kind of the third thing is just always going from general to specific. So that's always something I try to keep in mind, like not jumping straight into mechanics, giving the overall picture of what the story of the game is trying to tell you and like what, what we're even here doing and then kind of trickling down from there. It's kind of what we follow. Absolutely. That's a great way mm -hmm. to get into it. Uh, I just want to interject before we hop over to Dustin to say I'm the same way. I also <laughs> teach games via video, but I, I think it's because I need to interpret information visually. Jason, mm -hmm. is that uh, one of like kind of a, a separation yeah. of how people learn is visually versus auditory? Yeah, I mean, you have like your visual, you have your your audio, your, your text-based you have your kinesthetic like they have to do it with hands mm -hmm. and you have your multi because so like there are people that need to have the rule book and have the components in front of them i mean i know people that have everything like they have the rodney video and they have the rule book and they and like it, ha it has to come into this kind of kaleidoscopic uh approach or they could only learn from different certain people like they have to they come off of tone and they come off of you know like the the who is teaching very much matters or who's what's the gender what's the tone what's the relationship and there's so many different layers of it um i guess for me uh i think i'm a i'm a more that kaleidoscopic i need everything because i get very anxious because like if i get it from one source i i, I get that little distrustful it's like you really know it and then i need to <laughs> have that conversation <laughs> across multiple mediums. So. OK, it's a trust problem. Got it. Dustin, <laughs> Dustin. No question. Yes, 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 yes. Dustin, <laughs> tell us about your teaching style and your learning style. Uh, teaching, I think maybe to piggyback off of what Monique was saying about going from general to specific, I've learned for the people that I teach to, my groups, that that's the, the real key. Um, mm -hmm. If I get overexcited and I start you know, there's something really innovative in this game and I want to point it out. And I start talking about that and inevitably someone stops me and they're like, give us the big picture first, please. Uh, so that's that's a good reminder. Um, I think of like, even say Ikea graphics when they're showing you how to put furniture together, you know, you don't go into the exploded view before you've shown the unexploded view. Um, and so try to do that multiple times, teaching the game, even writing a rule book you give the big picture first and often sometimes the theme if it's a game that has really good mechanic thematic consonants will help with that um, people will remember they'll latch on to some 
minor element of the theme that reinforces the mechanics. And then when they're playing later on, they'll remember that you talked about that and that will help them. Maybe, maybe they'll even curtail a couple of questions they would have asked later on because nope, they remember it's like that. It works this way because the theme works that way. Um, and, and even doing that throughout the rules or throughout the, the teaching of the game, um, not just you know the overall object of the game before you launch into how you play, but even um, this is the overall structure of your turn before you launch into the specifics of a turn. So you can kind of uh, do that in different ways to kind of give people the general before you go to specifics and help people not get lost in the weeds. Um, Cause I, I hate that um, when, people, when I'm taught that way, if, if it, I, I have no framework for understanding how all these little uh, disparate rules latch onto a greater framework. Uh, so give me the framework first and then my mind does a better job of connecting all the pieces. Wonderful. Yeah, I tune out. <laughs> yeah, let's dive deeper. Okay, so yes. our viewers are creating their first rule book and they've got general to specific. That's how I'll overall format my rule book. But more specifically, how how is your dream rule book laid out? And do you like when there are two rule books? There's the overview rule book and the separate rule book, say if you're playing a fantasy flight game. Or is that uh, a, a little too much of separation? Uh, like how do you see your dream rule book laid out and what are some tips for that t i smile at because i actually have a i have a document that says this is how rule books should be laid out uh on my computer <laughs> because that's awesome okay just screen share yeah that's all we need here <laughs> we're producing rule books um so i edit in about 30 to 40 rule books a year um and I mean, it's it's not as much as Dustin probably, but and also these are very simple rule books. These are like <laughs> for two year olds. Um, but all of our rule books have the same format, and we found that this format is what tends to work best for our audience, which is more, again, that family gaming audience. So you're talking about gaming with kids, but often these rule books are sometimes the hardest because the ideas are very simple and it's very easy to kind of over explain. Um, and so with our rule books, we have a very strict structure that we stick to and we try to be as simple as possible. So the first thing is we have an overview sentence that ties in the theme. So like, Callie the calf is sick and you need to go get medicine. And then that's the theme. And then we'll have like a sentence that talks about um, players work together to go around the forest and collect the herbs needed and bring them back to the house to create the medicine, right? And then there's a little bit more. And then we talk about lucky die rolls will get you further something like that right so that's kind of the we talk about a general theme tie-in and then we talk a little bit more about the specifics and that's just an overview then we have the contents of the game so what materials are in the game so everyone can make sure that they have everything they need uh, and then we have the setup so this usually involves an image of the main play area in addition to potentially the player areas the player specific areas um, and then after setup, we, we do another little overview section of what either a turn will look like or what a round will look like, depending on the game. And then we go into the specifics of what you do on your turn. Uh, and with Hava games, it's a lot of you have a decision or you do a die roll and then you often have a yes, no situation. <laughs> Did you succeed? Yes, do this. Did you not succeed? Oh, too bad try do this like it's i write i have to look up synonyms for like different ways to say too bad all the time oh no um golly then, g exactly oh, oh i'm gonna use that one. <laughs> but, <laughs> then we have it's the next player's turn right and then we have uh if it is a round game we talk about what happens at the end of a round if it is not a game that has multiple rounds we say like continue taking turns until this something happens. And then we have the in-game section that describes how in-game is triggered and what everyone does. And then the last sentence of the rulebook main section is usually declaring the winner. So the person who did this wins. And then it, we're Haba. So all of our ties are always friendly. So there's also a sentence that says that. Um, and then if the game has anything that's more involved, so maybe specific cards or iconography um, or variants, that's where we have that in that after section, after the main end game. So we have more details on specific icons or cards. Um, we often sometimes have advanced variants or suggestions for parents to tweak the game rules to make them a little harder. But like, that is very specifically how we do our rulebook. And it's 
how we've also, I've also noticed a lot of rule books in the industry, not just how about have a very similar outline and structure. And I think that it's, it just really works well with what kind of we've all talked about with the general specific flow. Um, so yeah, that is, that is how we do our rule books. That's how I prefer to read the rule books. <laughs> um, I don't know if anybody else has a variant of that, but yeah. Yeah, I heard this described by Gil Hava as um, you need a rule book that goes both A to Z and Z to A simultaneously because you're not only teaching players for the first time, but you're also um, creating a reference for people who've played before but maybe needing to reference a certain section. Um, so uh, Monique, maybe you can tell us a little bit about like what you like and when you see that done right. Uh, or, or how you prefer to see gameplay formatted in a rule book? Well, it's it's interesting that T mentions you know the Haba uh, outline because I think that's the secret sauce. <laughs> I think that's like <laughs> it. That's 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 how I uh, prefer to learn games as well, and that can be applied to any game weight. And what I appreciate about Haba's games in particular is it's it's literally in an outline. It's like it's labeled like turn structure and like all this stuff. And I, you can apply that to a heavy game as well that has a lot of complicated rules. I think it's more for me about the comp compartmentalizing. Like you can see, it'll say in bold turns and then I can go there and say, okay, what do I do on my turn? And then it usually lists all the different actions that you can take, especially in like a Euro game or something. Um, but also for those heavier games that have like a lot of terminology, I do appreciate it when there's like an index, especially like games with cards that has like, um, a lot of like, oh, there's a difference between like exhausting versus spending or versus, you know, whatever the different terminology is. So I appreciate having an, an index, but definitely that like being able to just open even like a Lacerda rule book or something, being able to open it and look directly at the action that I'm trying to define mm -hmm. is is the, the key thing for me. Yeah, an index is a great mm -hmm. idea uh, just so people can find things quickly and not, not enough game books have index. Dustin, does this apply to you? Do you use the Haba structure when formatting your own <laughs> rule books? Or what's the Dustin Schwartz signature uh, style? I think it's a great style. Um, in fact, I, I envy T a little bit because of uh, having that sort of editorial control where for your own company, you, you, can, you can just say, hey, they're all going to be this way. Um, as a freelancer, I don't have quite that much uh, pull sometimes. And I have to... <laughs> bow to the company, you know, house styles, those sorts of things, um, which is okay. And I've learned to adapt. Um, but I think that's a, that is a great style. Uh, Becca, you were asking about like two book approaches, like fantasy mm. flight per se. Mm -hmm. I've never done that. Um, never had to just, there was no one who wanted to. The only time I've come close is um, sometimes solitaire variants have gotten complex enough now that they break those out into a separate book. Mm -hmm. um, so I've done that several times recently, which uh, it, it's not that information needed to be interwoven. It would have been difficult to do in a single book. It basically would have just doubled the thickness of, of the manual. And perhaps that's more intimidating to pick up a 40 page book than a 20 pager if you're not interested in the solitaire variant. Um, so, uh, but, but that sort of style um, that he was describing and, and Nick was adding on to, yeah, that's perfect. Um, and specifically, especially having the information blocked visually mm -hmm. in a way that you can, uh, you know, like, you know, you, you go to read about your turn and you kind of like flip a couple pages of your head. You're like, gosh, how long is this chapter? Basically, you know, <laughs> uh, you're trying to get a feel for how much information you are about to absorb in this next, you know, bit of reading. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to do that and, and have uh, clear and, and clever subheadings uh, and, and have it structured that way, because most of the games I work on tend to be, a little more complex where you do need to have, uh, you know, maybe four or five different levels of subheads uh, to get it all uh, yeah. formatted in, in a way that makes sense and that flows. Um, the, the, the tricky part sometimes is, I suppose, that uh, games that have a lot of graphic information uh, and, and figuring out where to communicate that. Um, and so the approach that a lot of rule books take um, is to have a section toward the beginning, somewhere toward the beginning, that just kind of is like a visual guide, uh, like a map key basically for all of the major components in that game, whether that's like maybe two unique types of cards and breaks mm -hmm. down what all that information is. Maybe the game board or the player board has a similar thing where there's like, you know, half a dozen icons or areas that all need to be defined in order for sometimes even the game setup to make sense. So figuring out 
And sometimes it, it feels intimidating to try to put that information like, well, you haven't even shown them how to set up the game yet. Yeah, but you need that information to be able to set up the game. That's that's the tricky part with the cleverness of uh, of really where the modern game design scene is right now um, for, for hobby gamers that uh, sometimes it's, it's so clever. And, and I know a lot of game designers who don't struggle with that issue because uh, they don't they don't have to write the rules. In fact, I, I, I've, I've had a lot of yeah, uh, you know the designer's like this is a very simple rule, and then I get to get around to like figuring out how to put it on paper. I'm like, this isn't so simple after all. Uh, and and yeah. that's where the affordances of like the visual medium, and which is probably most similar to someone teaching the game in person, which is often the case. Like game designer, you know, teaching the game to all their friends, uh, family members, and that's that's the experience they know from how people react to like the perceived complexity of the game is teaching it. But the document has uh, its own affordances, but also its own problems and, and shortcomings. And one of them is, uh, you know, the lack of being able to just point to a card and say, this is what that card back looks like. You know, I think Roddy does that a lot in, in his videos. And so do you, Monique. Um, so that's where documents fall short a little bit, especially when I work on them, which is just exclusively like a text format before graphics have been added. So gotcha. Jason, wow. where are you and uh, what are your favorite ways that you've seen rule books laid out? Uh, what's your advice to just general? What's the best way to lay out a rule book? Actually, uh, can I uh, punt and ask Dustin a follow up question? Is yeah, because okay? <laughs> uh, you mentioned before about different companies having different their kind of in house styles. Give me like that'd be really interesting to know if company if there's like a huge variety if there's um you know like do do people like even actively resist what T was laying out in terms of that you know the the different structure and they just they just feel like they have to go a different direction maybe you can give us a sense for like kind of filling in that picture. I'd say they're all variants on that. Uh, okay. They they all follow that idea of like kind of siloing information. But for instance, uh, one publisher who I work with, they really like to. Um, do an, uh, their, their component overview that we were talking about with maybe like a visual guide laying it out. They don't really do that. They instead just do a bulleted list, but then they do like maybe three or four pages with like a paragraph breakdown of each uh, major component and their function and role within the game with like just a you know picture of that card, picture of a uh, pile of these resources and description of them, that sort of thing. So that's that's very different than other ones where you know you introduce the the, the function of the pieces as it comes up um, within the, the teach itself. Um, but uh, yeah, there hasn't been too many that are um, so avant garde that I've you know like really been uh, either blown away by it positively or negatively in terms of the structure. But just just variations on how people like to present the the information. So answering your question, Becca, I think the the best rule book is when I don't have to read cover to cover. Yes. Like the, the best rule book is the best rule book is the rule is the game and the way the game is built. Right. I am a very heavy N on the Myers Briggs. Like I'm a very intuitive person. And I think, you know, people are they very they vary with their intuitions and especially with games i mean this is our hobby so it's like we're not going to get people's a game all the time when it comes to reading the rules so like i think people are going to rely a lot on their intuition in order to make you know learn the game so like you know setting that you know setting that general thing right as everybody was mentioning and then a lot of my intuition just kicks in from there it's like if i'm you're trading in the mediterranean you're doing this this and this now it's like okay if i see gold i think gold, i automatically think that gold's going to work a certain way and, you know, or, or like, you know, if I see workers or if I see the different you know, buildings and, you know, materials, I, I, I'm going to get them. I'm, I already have like a, a baked in think of way I, that I think these should work. And I love it when a game just kind of like eases me into that. And then I don't have to read the rules. And then, I, and then the rules at that point become like a reference to like, okay, if something's working wonky, be like, as you were saying before, game, game design is getting clever and cleverer, Right. If there's, if there's some wonk there, then I want to be able to access whatever that wonkiness is pretty easily. Yeah. Right? So I, so as opposed to, I mean, T is, you're totally the opposite of me. I do not, I have, I don't think I've read a single book cover to cover, not one rule book cover to cover. It's like, I, I start it, I get going, and then I dip back in whenever I need to figure something out. Mm. Oh, wow. Love that. So many different types of learners. Yeah. I, I want to 
Just second what you said, Jason. I uh, read cover to cover, but I love when there's visual variation. Um, so the use of uh, italics or a side box that explains something, I think that layout is ultimate for when, when I'm consuming a game. Um, and then I also like uh, all the card examples to be in the back because I want it to be as short as possible in the you know round descriptions um, and all that. Uh, what do you all think about the use of italics and the use of examples? And um, is it what it could be a pitfall with like, maybe putting um, an important twist on what may be an intuitive rule for you know common gamers that you kind of like need to make sure you're highlighting the things that are big changes. Do you guys have any advice for, or do you folks have any advice on um, when those things come up of like make sure, making sure that a very specific new rule gets enough notice? Yeah, definitely. Um, layouts, yeah, I'll just jump. Um, layouts, graphic design are a big part of it. Um, I highly recommend uh, people, if you can't afford to hire a graphic designer, like somebody that has the experience with doing layouts, look at your favorite rule book and just maybe copy the style a little bit, like um, clear headings, bold. Don't be afraid of using bold or making yes. a one section title larger. <laughs> Um, and with italics, there's kind of this unspoken rule in board gaming where italics equals example. Mm -hmm. um, and especially if you have a block of italics, that's just an example. Uh, and some people, me, um, I skip those if I don't have to. So what usually happens is I'll read a rule book and I'll read a section of rules. And if I get it, I just get it. And if I'm like, oh, there's an example, I get the rule. I don't need to read that. However, if I'm reading the rules and I'm like, what? And then I'm like, oh, there's an example. I'll read the example. Um, and so your example should help clarify tricky areas. They should not be very crazy in-depth like things. Uh, you can make your examples a little shorter by only including however many players need to be included for the example. So if you're talking about one specific thing that someone will do on the turn, you only need to talk about one person. You don't need to be like, Tony, Becca, and you know, whoever are playing a game. Like you can just, you know, keep it down. The other thing that I really like in rule books that I've seen, how it games we don't have this, our games are not complicated enough, but I really like it when the example players uh, kind of are swapped. And then at the, like, if there ever is a situation where like you have to explain in-game scoring, I like that like all of the examples for in-game scoring use all of the players that have been used throughout the book. So then you're like, oh, they were all playing a game together. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> I like that how, uh, that flow. And there's another nice thing that when you do that, you can, you can be a bit more inclusive with the mm -hmm. uh, players with doing different types of genders, different names. You can use names that are maybe not uh, just, you know, Tom, Jill, and Bob. Like you can use names that are a little bit more neat, unique. So that's, that's my two cents on examples, but it's one of those things you have to really think about, like some people will just skip examples. So if you end up putting something that's very important for a rule or put a rule in an example, 50% uh, maybe of your audience will just miss it. Uh, yeah. There is a game yeah. years ago called Imminent, Do Imminent Domain Microcosm. I'm just going to pick on them a little bit. They did a one page rule sheet of this like complicated card game and there were so many rules just hidden in the examples uh and i like wrote the publisher and i was like this makes no sense there's nothing like you can't play and he's like all the rules are there just read the examples and i was like <laughs> no <laughs> i cannot so yeah do you so well. you're saying examples kind of fit in the same box as flavor text okay uh, sometimes yeah for me if yeah, i if i I'm don't the need way. the rule clarification yeah when you think about thoughts, like reading yeah. a website, uh, you get like banner ads, right? And our brains have learned to filter out the banner ads. Oh. Like ask somebody what's in the banner ad, they're not gonna be able to tell you. Most of the, unless if they're focusing on, you know, what they're looking at, right? Which is what you're supposed to do with the rule book. And so like when somebody puts an example or like, okay, this is important to know, there's a pretty good chance that someone's gonna filter that out as like, you know, basically a, a text banner ad and like not read that. So like, I think the like don't put something in there the first time 
like highlighting and bolding and everything mm-hmm. that, that don't th- that that can't be the only mention of a thing, especially if it's really important. Like, you know, that's why it's good as an example or it's good as a, OK, uh, you know, did you remember or like especially like, you know, kind of unintuitive things like I mm-hmm. talked about intuition and intuition. Like if your game, if you know your game kind of takes a left turn at a certain spot. Where it's like the, it, it, you know, you thought gold was was good for money, but actually it's good to trade in for this, this, and this. Then that'd be a thing to put in your put in the the basic paragraph, just in the actual heart of it, and then as an emphasis. Uh, my teacher called it emphasis, so I like it as an emphasis thing. <laughs> put it, in, you know, also there. Like repetition is a good teacher as well, but make sure that it's in the center because you don't want people to just kind of like filter it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I'm really glad that you both, that you all mentioned that because I don't do well with italics at all <laughs> or examples. Like if I'm reading a rule book and especially if the rule book is like 17 pages and it's like, oh, okay, I understand that. I'm definitely going to skip the example. I'm just going to go straight to the next page because I need to get through 16 more pages. And so there have been a lot of occasions where in our gameplay videos, if we make a mistake, a lot of times it's usually because I didn't read the example. <laughs> like I'll go back to that page and I'll say, oh my God, if we just read the example, we would have known this. But because it's like here and everything else is here, like I didn't read it. And so um, kind of going off of what uh, Jason said also, when you have a rule change or something that you want to emphasize, like in your rule book, it's important to know that a lot of times the people who are reading your rule book are going to now teach your game. And so this is something that you want to emphasize in a big way. So for me, bold bolding works or like I really appreciate it when uh, people do like a box that's like a, a different color or something that's like here, you need to know this line. It changes the rules a little bit. You need to emphasize this when you're teaching it as well. And uh, they'll repeat it somewhere down the line in the rule book as well. So I'm thinking like, oh, we really need to know this rule. Like this is an important part of the game. So just kind of stuff like that helps a lot. Yeah. Is not oh, bad. Okay. I know people are trying to get the page count down. <laughs> <laughs> repeating is not big, especially when it's important. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you heard hard and fast rule. No new information in italics. Um, I, I like Italics, that. Italics, bold, boxes, no new information in any of that yeah. stuff. It's, it's be for <laughs> Go, emphasis and for going, flavor. Going back to Monique's uh, general to specific, I love a summary box and a detailed description of what I already know from my summary box. Dustin, is that something that you ever incorporate? Uh, like after the information you've learned or before, prior? after, anywhere. Give me a summary. Yeah, yeah I like to do that. Um, have have a summary like that and bonus points if it's formatted in a way that kind of looks like a, a chapter summary or that you'd encounter in a in a textbook or something like that to kind of show like hey this information is siloed read all this and now oh look all this stuff laid out in much more detail um but i know you know it's the the rule that we probably all learned for speech giving in in high school right you, you tell them what you're going to tell them and you tell them what you want to tell them and then you tell them what you told them uh, I struggle sometimes with the repetition thing, um, as in I, I don't like to have repetition, but I know it's good, but I struggle because sometimes, because then you're going to have those situations when someone uh, reads like the the secondary mention of the certain rule, and then, they're, and then they're in the forums online, hey, there wasn't enough information about that. Well, it was explained <laughs> elsewhere too, but because you saw it mm-hmm. there, you thought maybe it wasn't explained somewhere else in the document in more detail. Interesting. Uh, so that's uh- where cross cross-referencing can be good. Yeah. Other thoughts on repetition? Is there anybody that says, no, say it once, you're making your rulebook longer when you repeat? Or I really like that uh, analogy to high school debate right there. <laughs> good. That, that's a good way to keep it in mind. I think... I, oh. oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I like repetition on important things. Like Monique was saying, like if the rule is going to change the game in a way that people might not intuitively expect, I like having repetition. Um, But you don't need to repeat something like, if the deck is empty, shuffle the discard (laughs) to make a new deck. Like you can just state that once. If at any time you need to draw cards and you cannot, shuffle the discard and make a new deck. (laughs) Just put it once, you're done. Um, But if it's something a lot more important, a lot more weird, kind of a weird Mm. quirk, um, repetition is really great. Uh, I was trying to think of an example, and I cannot say the name of the new Uwe Rosenberg game, the really involved one. Color tell. But you have this like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have this thing that you put out every season, and if you're playing with less than four players, you have to like artificially 
uh, cover spots with a card and they explain it like three times and it took all three times for me to get it. So <laughs> I was good with that. <laughs> um, a friend of mine did a, a game called Liberation, an 18 card button shy game. And in that game, you discard cards face down. What? <laughs> See, that's Tell me three times. Yeah, Tell me three times if that. you want my discard face down. Yeah. And give me an you know, example you, with you pictures. You will miss it the first time. You will miss it the first time, but it's a huge part of the game because it's hidden information. So yeah. Interesting. That's yeah. That okay. So if it's unusual, repeat it. But it is to be noted to Monique's point earlier. Uh, don't make assumptions about what your audience may know. You do need to tell people that they must shuffle the discard if they run out of cards because some people have this may be their first game ever. Who knows? Yeah, that's the thing we've had on a Hobbit game, we had a forum where people were complaining because they were like, well, the game is so short because the, the deck runs out. Oh. And I was just like, oh, oh! oh no. <laughs> yeah. So let's shift to a slightly different topic. Um, I think new terminology is something a lot of very thematic games like to bring in. Your hand's called something different. Your deck is called something different. Your turns and your rounds are called something different. And this is maybe the thing that when I'm learning a new game, I tease the most of like, ooh, my action power initiative, you know, <laughs> instead of like my turn. Um, <laughs> what is your advice with um, when this kind of stuff adds flavor and when it's going too far or, or how do you feel about um, terminology in general? Let's see. Uh, let's just let's just go around, Jason. Oh, okay. Um, <sighs> I guess like I, I think of like Android Netrunner, right? They call the hand the grip, and it's <laughs> yeah. like, oh, come on. <laughs> Although, okay, normally no. Like I'm a hugely intuitive person, right? And I need I need that you know call around around call a turn to turn. It's nothing about that, but I think. Mm -hmm. There are going to be certain examples where the world of the game is the 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 creators have invested so much in the world of the game that maybe they can almost like sell it with their enthusiasm, like they just like they just blew you away with like I think of uh, Ricky Royal made a game called Renegade and everything is called something different every like you know the the data nodes and the uplinks and all this other stuff and it's like this was really hard to learn but and we told him and he's like this is really important <laughs> and he just kept on going and going and just and eventually we kind of you know just over the course of playing it it's like okay you kind of inter and upload you know the the proper you know schema that's hard that's hard you know and it, it, you'd have to really get behind what you're like if you're doing it just because you think it's cool mm, think, <laughs> that, think twice that, i'll say that if you're not willing to go whole hog if you're only doing it because you think it's cool Think, I think twice. Think twice in that one. T, what do you think on terminology? I hate terminology. <laughs> <laughs> Netrunner. So Netrunner has a special place in my heart. I'm bring, using an example because it's one of the like worst games for this. Uh, my husband and I started dating, and Netrunner is how we started like connecting. Um, and partially because I cannot internalize the technology or the terminology of that game at all. Like I just cannot even. Um, and I tried and I played a lot and it, he can do it just fine. And so finally I was just, I would just be like, you're doing what with my what? Like, <laughs> I can't even. Um, but one of the ways that when I read rules, when I finally get the rule book, if it's a rule, if it's a game that uses a lot of terminology, I actually will just like completely ignore that terminology when I'm teaching the game to other people. I will just teach the game with the terminology that people are more used to. Um, so, there's certain terminology where if you're don't reinvent the wheel, like if people are used to holding cards in their hand and that's called the hand, then don't reinvent the wheel. In my opinion, it's not going to really help you unless it's a very big investment you're willing to make. Um, but if your game has a specific board area and there's specific paces, places on the board where there's things that are unique or need to be named certain things, that's fine player boards same dealio like you can have a specific area that's called the trash you can have a specific area called the jungle like whatever you want that terminology is fine but don't reinvent the wheel on commonly used like a deck is a deck everybody knows what a deck is 
Even if all you've played in your entire life is go fish or old maid, you know what a deck is. So don't reinvent that and call it a library. Well, you know what I mean? As so a magic that's... player, I take offense. It is called the library. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't play magic either. But, uh... <laughs> yeah, so that's my Jesus on the terminology that is it can be fun and can be thematic, but you're in certain ways, you're kind of handicapping yourself or, or hindering your rule your your rule book and your and people learning from you so yeah Monique so I haven't played um, Android Netrunner so I'm not exactly sure about about that one but for me I, I think it's more like funny it's more comical like when I teach a game and I see that somebody has renamed round something else or something like that I think I allow a little bit more for creative freedom in that sense because I understand that designers have a world that they're they're living in that they really want to express so I will tell people like oh this is the grip, but it's really your hand. <laughs> so I'll give them like what the actual like terminology we are used to is, but I will tell them what it's called in the rule book because sometimes like other parts of the game will refer to it as the grip. And so it's like, well, when you see the grip, it means your hand. Um, but I think there was a game that I had played within the past year that had so much term, I think it was BIOS Origins or something. So a game like that, where it has a lot of uh, functional terminology that's not necessarily uh, intuitive. I appreciate it when, like I was mentioning earlier, when it has a glossary or if there's like a player aid uh, that defines those things. Because I remember when I was playing that game, I was pretty much glued to that player aid the entire time. Like, I want to do this action, but I don't really know what it does. Um, but I think the hardest thing for me is when people re... I think like in general, we have, a, or at least I have a universal understanding of what rounds are and turns are when they're displayed in the rule book. And so sometimes every now and then I'll run into a rule book where they use rounds and turns in a different way. So like a turn was really meant as a round and like, uh, you know, that is like the hardest thing for me. I have to reread it multiple times when that happens. Yeah, they're um, really just hurting themselves when they try and redetermine the, the definition of, of a known term, right? Yeah, Justin, that's Justin, <laughs> what do you think? Uh, I, I have been um, in the camp of using of inventing terminology that designers didn't even have when the rule book came to me sometimes. Uh, and usually that's when I find that um, there is a, like there's a whole collective, say like half a dozen unique rules that relate to this one specific element of gameplay. And if you can summarize all that stuff into one, one term so that every time that the rule book subsequently references that you don't have to awkwardly like spool out an entire sentence just to say what you're trying to say and that's doubly true if you have a game that uses text on cards in a major way um, because there you are you have much more limited real estate to work with so that's why magic and, and games of its ilk um, are so keyword heavy um, probably because over the years especially you know, you're trying to come up with new things that haven't been done in that space before which means you've got like this rule that you have to define in the rules with real estate you don't have on the cards and then you simply reference it with that word on the card and people get it so um i think of one example uh being a recent two-player game called stellar mm. um, and the guys who designed that uh, they're friends of mine they are very much um, engineers that's their day job and that's how they think of game design it's all mechanics uh theme is whatever um so when it was themed to be about stargazing, um, it was really was just uh, awesome art um, and some factoids on the cards themselves. Um, and there's like two separate player areas that each player has um, that work in functionally very, very different ways. Um, and I was trying to figure out a good way to differentiate them. Like, is you know, you could just say player area A and B, but that's confusing and you know, dry as dirt. <laughs> so uh, we, we decided eventually to uh, just use like, you know, let the theme inform the terminology. So we called one uh, your telescope and one your notebook. So um, calling them those things, I guess in a way, it's kind of like calling your, your deck a library in magic uh, in some ways. Um, but we do still have a hand, right? You still have a hand of cards. And I, I wasn't going to mess with that. I was like, Nope, it's just the hand. We have these two areas <laughs> that differentiate from each other that are not really like anything you've played before. So, you know, it just player area is just boring. So, so in that way, yeah, I, I've actually, uh, it's something that I look for when a rule book first comes across my desk is, um, are there areas where um, 
that could be useful in that way. Or in, and sometimes it's from a different angle. It's um, they'll have like a whole bunch of very, very thematic terminology. And then there's a couple of things that are really non thematic at all. And it's like a four word descriptor. Um, it's like, well, could we use a, could we use a theme label here um, that people's understanding of the theme, even if it's just as explained by your one page introduction at the start of the rule book, could that help them remember um, this one rule if you, you know, kind of tie the theme into how you name certain elements of whether it be cards or the player area or pieces themselves. Yeah, love all that. One little thing I would add, if you are going to add terms, um, don't give three terms for different levels of the new thing. Like, these are your gemstones that fit inside your cave that goes on <laughs> your player um, uh, secret lair. You know, like, now that's three new terms that I need to teach my players, just call them gems. <laughs> um, yeah, because I've seen that one happen before. Uh, so we don't have too much time left, but so um, let's just talk about our biggest pet peeves uh, or like the worst things you could possibly do. Um, and then I'll give a couple examples. Not having a player aid is, uh, I'm, al I'm always very upset when there's not a player aid card for me to pass out uh, and have one for everyone. Um, as well as... Yeah. Uh, don't fill up too many pages with theme. I will read a paragraph about the theme that helps me be immersed, but I don't need every page to have half a page of text about your lore, which it's important for you to create, but it's not important for it to take up half, half your rule book. Those are mine. Um, uh, pet peeves. Let's, let's start with Monique. Um, my biggest pet peeve is probably when the rule book is an essay. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, I don't really come across that too often. Like I, like we were mentioning earlier, it's, it's pretty much what T was saying with the structure, the beautiful structure. But uh, when it is an essay, it tends to become repetitive and I can't find anything that I need. And so those games will tend to take me forever to learn them. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's a pretty big struggle. Uh, Jason. Can I punt because I, I don't, I'm choking. <laughs> You can punt. You'll think of one, Dustin. Uh, my biggest pet peeve is when the rulebook doesn't visually properly communicate um, the breaks between information it expects you to digest. Um, like if your player turn is just one gigantic block of text, or even sometimes less, you know, uh, or more innocuous than that, uh, maybe two or three uh, important concepts that are all crammed together in in one large paragraph and there's no there's no indication you just read it all and you're like wow that was that was really a heck of a lot um but if if you know you were to more carefully break that information up put white space make paragraph breaks mm -hmm. um add a visual off to the side doesn't even have to have accompanying text just like you know ikea style graphics showing you exactly what you're reading how that works um that's so much better than like reading it all and then okay yeah i gotta read that at least three more times for it to sink in whereas if you did do it like just spool it out one important concept at a time and properly visually communicate like hey that's a that's it digest that now you move on to the next thing because uh, that's how i read and and i don't like having to go back and, and reread stuff um so i like I, I suppose my pet peeve is when uh it's just a wall of text uh kind of the old school Grognard war game style of rule book where it's all just just so much text. Every meal needs dessert. Digest it, move on. Yeah. <laughs> Tea? <laughs> My puppy, very similar. So rule books that are just essays. My husband really likes war games, classic old school made in the 70s, 80s war games. Those rule books are just essays. Uh, use bullet points. Bullet points are your friends. Uh, if you're talking about turn flow and there's a sequence to it, you can even use numbered bullet point lists. It's amazing. Uh, but white space, um, breaking stuff out, super, super helpful, super important. It just really, when it, uh, there's so many unnecessary <laughs> words that you have to put into text when you're writing it in paragraph form that you just don't need when you do bullet points. Um, and that's kind of, that my other pet peeve is when people use bullet points but they just like maintain the sentences like you can <laughs> just shorten them just it, bullet points yeah. don't need capitalized first word like period it doesn't need to be a perfect sentence just give me the meat um so yeah and then i think my other one is 
for complex games, if you don't have in your component breakdown or in your setup, if you don't have that visual key of what everything is, I'm just sitting there on page three going, which card is the harvest card? <laughs> like <laughs> visual keys are fantastic when you have like more than, I don't know, four different types of cards or if you have more than two different types of card decks, give me a visual key or something clear. The blue back versus the red back. That just, ah, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. And not just colors, but also symbols for the colorblind folks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Jason, let's ask you a different question. What I, I is- got, I, I, I got one. Oh, I, got one. I okay. did get one. I did get it. Um, uh, <laughs> so, I, I mean, so much of what I mean in terms of how I think of rule books is about intuition and like going like the, it's the, rule books are never in a vacuum. You're always in conversation with a mind. Right. And it's obviously, you know, there's different minds that do different things and it's very but but i think like we you know over the time we've discovered a lexicon like a deck and a hand and all that kind of thing so it's like don't you know try not to fight that and it's like if you are going to go against that then say why like you know uh so like going back to the example of my friend put you know discard okay discard down as well as discard up he explained why because we don't want your enemy to know your secrets or anything like that so it's like you know, so now I know why, and and now I'm not gonna. I'm less likely to forget why. You know, as I'm doing the game, doing that. So it's like it's 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 worth, it's worth kind of knowing the mind of the creator in that way. And I feel like I'm kind of communicating with a mind as opposed to just ingesting a, a block of text. Awesome. All right. Well, I don't want to go before, in, just in case anybody has any expert advice about either teaching or laying out a rule book or just teaching at the table. If there's anything else you got to get off your chest that we didn't cover, um, let's just sh shout it out, please. Uh, if anybody has any other information to impart to our lovely viewers today. Uh, I would say if you're writing a rule book and you're designing a game, uh, take advantage of blind play testing, uh, especially if your blind play tester can record or is comfortable with you watching a recording of them blind play testing or you just standing there awkwardly, not saying anything while they read your rule book and then play the game, um, because that will give you a lot of insight as to what you might be missing in your rule book, where questions might come up, that kind of stuff. And if you're not familiar, blind play testing is where you hand someone your rule book and the game and they read the rule book and they play the game without you saying anything. <laughs> uh, like if they're going to drive their car off a cliff and, and you know, it's going to be horrible, me. <laughs> Maybe then you intervene, but you make sure you take a lot of notes as to where people might be tripping over things, both in the design of the game itself, but also more importantly, the rule book and how it's written and how it's interpreted. So blind play testing is so helpful in so many ways. Final advice, anyone else? I know we've um, been talking about rule books a little bit, but in terms of uh, like teaching in person, and uh, I can't wait to get back to that more often. Um, <laughs> I, one thing that someone mentioned, and I wish I could remember who it was to credit them. I think I saw it on Twitter a couple of years ago. Uh, their advice was when you're finished teaching the game before you're about to play, don't say, um, are there any questions? Because then you put the onus on them to say, no, there's no questions. I understand everything perfectly. Um, say, what questions do you have? Um, because there's bound to be questions. And there you you open up the forum for people to say, well, yeah, I, I didn't quite understand that when you were saying that, but I didn't. I didn't feel like stopping you in the middle of your flow earlier kind of thing. So I've taken that to heart and found that that's useful and uh, really sets the table for the sort of like tone and, and friendliness that um, I want to impart when I'm teaching again. Monique, anything else? Yeah, um, that's awesome. I kind of wanted to speak on that as well, but yeah, I, like I kind of lost my thought. Um, but going <laughs> based off of the, the rule book part of it, uh, something that really helps is especially if there's a lot of components to the game. And uh, we're talking about the different color card backs. Not every rule book does this, which is surprising to me, but just having the visual contents, the visual components list. And if you have cards that have a certain anatomy to them, like up here is the cost, down here is the name, that you know, always having that like visual with the arrows pointing at them, that is huge for me because I'll typically uh, read a rule book before I even like lay out the components. And so if I'm able to know how to play the game before even laying out the components, that's like, Perfect rule book, <laughs> in my opinion. And Jason, anything else? Uh, yeah, I mean, don't assume that everybody's going to read the rule book front to back. 
You know, I mean, construct. You know, I, I think so. That's what Jehovah said. Sometimes people just read it Z to A, like they'll just kind of like go go and then fish for the information later. Um, you know, that can't be the answer if people are getting consistently getting rules wrong. Mm -hmm. Like, as I'll see that a lot, where on the forum a designer will get a little frustrated, right? It's like, well, I explained this already. It's like this is already there. And it's right. And it's like, okay, um, if people are getting the same kind of thing wrong, well, that's an indication that you know something in your game it kind of went haywire right or or that like it's not like well not haywire but like because game probably works fine it's just in terms of, in terms of the the connection with that, that the players are making so i mean you know and so like rule book writing has to kind of oh like rule book rule presentation has to go with the game itself and, and the construction of the game and if like you and if in the blind play testing which is a thing that i was going to point out to you uh, really a like, really good point if in blind play testing people uh, issues are emerging over and over again like this is where the gamer this is where players are kind of slipping up either address that in the game maybe there's another way to do it or really emphasize that so that people don't have to like go through the whole thing in order to encounter that little wrinkle absolutely well, uh, I know that each of you could talk for uh, you know another 24 hours with all of the knowledge in your brain as to what makes a game great. Um, but I hope that this brief window has given some of our viewers an insight into how they can create the perfect rule book. Thanks so much to Jason, T, Monique, and Dustin for joining me here today. I appreciate all of you giving me your time and giving your time to D4. Um, and thanks so much to everybody watching and hope you enjoy the rest of the D4 tabletop creation conference. Take care.